Hello, everyone, and welcome to Electronic Records. My name is Ethan Anderson. I am the Government Records Archivist for the Kansas Historical Society, and I will be your host for this presentation. If you joined us for Records Management 101, you may be asking why we even have a separate presentation for electronic records. You will recall that I mentioned that the state of Kansas is format agnostic, meaning that the state doesn't care whether you keep a record in paper or electronic format, just so long as you keep it. Now that is definitely true, but we split up these presentations because electronic records can be especially difficult to manage. When it comes to paper records, preserving them for a long time can be as simple as putting them in an acid-free box and placing them in a temperature and humidity controlled environment. You don't have to keep checking on the box. As long as you don't have mice or other issues with your storage area, those records should last a very long time left to themselves. If you have your records in an ideal environment, an environment with very little light and proper temperature and humidity controls, how long will those records last? It really depends on what type of material we're talking about. For everyday paper, microfilm, and records on acid-free paper, those records can and should last for literally hundreds of years. Newspapers don't quite last as long because many were and still are printed on low-quality paper and use really acidic inks, and so they're simply not meant to last forever. However, newspapers can still potentially last hundreds of years. Now look at the precipitous decline in longevity when we get to electronic records. Floppy disks, cassette tapes, VHS tapes, even some CDs and DVDs may not last long at all. They may not even last your career with your agency. Why is this? What are some factors which make electronic records so difficult to preserve for a long time? The first issue with electronic records is hardware or software obsolescence. Perhaps the storage component of the media still functions, but a physical component of the VHS tape or floppy disk is irreparably damaged. Maybe the VHS tape or floppy disk is still in complete working order, but you no longer have a way to read it, which I am guessing is the case for most of us today. Another issue to contend with is bit rot. Bit rot occurs at the bits and bytes level of a file, and it's when the ones and zeros that make up that file just randomly switch places. If this happens too much, your file becomes corrupted and is no longer readable, and if it's a photo, you may get something looking similar to the image at the right. For whatever reason, bit rot happens most frequently with things like thumb drives and zipped files, so it is best to avoid these whenever possible. In short, benign neglect with electronic records is not okay. Unlike with paper records, you can't simply put these items on a shelf, ignore them for 20, 50, or 100 years, and still expect to be able to access their contents. It's just not going to happen. Another issue with electronic records is the sheer volume of file types they come in. We've included here just some of the numerous types you may come across on a regular basis. It should be fairly obvious by now that Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, and emails are records, but also keep in mind that social media posts are electronic records, your agency's web page is a record, and text messages are electronic records. Be especially careful if you're sending work-related texts on your personal phone, as these can be requested as part of a core request. So the best thing to do is simply not use your personal phone for work purposes. Another issue with electronic records is that records management strategies simply haven't kept pace with all the changes in technology. Email has been around for roughly 50 years and agencies still struggle with how best to preserve them. Part of that is on us as the users. It's easy for people to grasp that a mailed letter is a piece of correspondence, but they may not think they need to treat their email the same way when in fact they should. Electronic records are also usually not designed to last forever. They may only be designed to last 5 or 10 years or until the next version of their software comes out, which definitely makes accessing long-term records difficult. And often one of the biggest issues we come across with electronic records is simply knowing what we have and where it is located. If you have a file cabinet, you know that you can open it up at any time, see exactly how many records you have, what order they're in, and the context that they're in. But often with electronic records, we have no idea. Most people don't know or have the slightest idea what records are located on their shared drive or even how many records there are. Now before we get into tips on preserving electronic records, we should probably answer one quick question. Are electronic records government records? Yes, absolutely. 
If you watched our Records Management 101 presentation, you should remember that everything you use on a day-to-day -day basis to complete your job is a record. And again, the important point here is regardless of physical form or characteristics. So whether you're using a Word document, a TIFF image file, a social media post, or an email message, it is considered a government record by the state of Kansas. Another thing I should mention is that technically speaking, if you have obsolete media in your office and you have no idea what's on it, you are not allowed to destroy those records. They could be labeled cat photos, but theoretically they could contain annual reports or precedent setting litigation files, which must be archived. So don't destroy things unless you know precisely what records you have and if you can point to a retention schedule that gives you the authority to destroy those records. All right, so how can you work to ensure that your electronic records are accessible for years to come? First, store your records on a network server and make sure they are backed up daily. Also, be aware of where your backups are located. If you have backups located in another building, how far away is that building from your main facility? Will a tornado, flood, or other disaster that hits your main building also impact or destroy the building where your backups are located? One useful acronym to keep in mind is LOX, which stands for Lots of Copies Keeps Stuff Safe. We encourage all agencies to keep a minimum of three copies of their electronic records. That way, if your main copy gets knocked out and maybe even your primary backup gets knocked out as well, you still have an unaffected version of those records stored in a safe place. While we're on the topic of backups, we get quite a few questions about storing records in the cloud. At the Historical Society, we're pretty big proponents of the cloud, but we acknowledge that a lot of people are not, and that's fine. We encourage you to do whatever works best for your agency and whatever you are comfortable with. If that means using the cloud, great. Uh, if you prefer more traditional storage, that's fine too. The only thing I will say is that in the event of a disaster, it's often much easier to recover your records if you have them stored in the cloud rather than in a separate server that may or may not have been affected by the disaster. Another thing you can do to ensure the preservation of your electronic records is to choose a preservation file format. Choose a format that is going to preserve all the data within a file, doesn't significantly alter the file, won't change frequently, is not password protected, and is widely used. For example, at the Historical Society, we've made the conscious decision that all of our image files are to be saved as TIFF files, and all of our important documents are to be saved as PDF files. Our thinking was that Microsoft used to have .doc files, they're now on .docx files, and chances are they'll have another file type somewhere down the road. However, at least currently, it looks like PDFs should basically be around forever. Another great step to take to ensure the preservation of your electronic records is to establish some naming guidelines. Think about how people are going to be searching for these records in the future. If you have licensing files at your agency, should the name of those files include the licensee's name, the license number, the date the license was issued, or all three of those things? If all three of those things should be included, in what order should they be listed? Try also to be as descriptive as you can in your file names. For example, here we have listed two file names, Bob's File 1 and SRB Meeting Packet 2020-0116. The first name doesn't give us much information at all. Who is Bob? What project was he working on when he created this file? When was it created? Only Bob is going to know that information, and even he might not be sure. In the second example, however, you can clearly discern that this is the meeting packet from the January 16th, 2020 meeting of the State Records Board. Besides being descriptive, try to use as few characters as you can when naming files. Most files have a standard character limit of 256 characters, which includes both the file name itself as well as the pathway to get to that file. So if you have to click through a lot of folders to get to a file, you may be getting close to that character limit even before you start naming the file. If you go past the 256 character limit, it can cause your IT staff some issues when backing up those files or if you ever have to migrate those files. For the naming guidelines at the Historical Society, we don't use any special characters, so no dollar signs, ampersands, pound signs, etc. Uh, these can also cause some issues during migration. We also don't use spaces, we use underscores or dashes for the exact same reason. 
For dates, we always use eight characters. The first four are the year, followed by the month, and then the date. Again, these are just a few examples. Do whatever works best for your agency, but be sure that whatever your naming guidelines are, they are short, descriptive, and used consistently. Also, use a logical folder structure. Don't have empty files lying around, and don't arrange your records so that you have to click through 10 or 12 different levels of folders to access a file. We don't recommend having more than about six levels of subfolders. In general, be efficient and be sure the names of your folders are unique and make sense. Lastly, train your staff on these guidelines. It will be a lot easier to get people to follow whatever guidelines you decide to use if you involve them from the start rather than attempting to enforce compliance later on. No discussion of electronic records would be complete without discussing what is probably the elephant in the room, email. Email should be treated like all other correspondence, so you should follow one of the three series dedicated to correspondence on the state general schedule. Back in 2020, we also updated ITEC guideline 6401 to help manage electronic records, so feel free to go and check that out. Apart from that, we highly encourage you to sort your email by subject, project, or whatever else makes sense. Don't just leave all of your emails in your inbox. You can also use tags in Office 365, they're called categories, to help sort your email and make searching easier. One last preservation issue that most of us will unfortunately have to deal with at one point or another is malware. Malware is designed to intentionally damage or disable your computer or your entire system and comes in many forms, viruses, spyware, adware, etc. One of the most malicious forms it comes in is ransomware. During a ransomware attack, hackers gain access to your system, encrypt your files, and then demand that your organization pay a ransom in order to decrypt those files. Not only has ransomware been getting more and more common, but more and more small institutions like county governments have been targeted, as hackers rightly perceive that they serve a vital purpose, but do not have loads of money to spend on IT. In the last few years, there have been a number of ransomware attacks here in Kansas. In October 2021, a ransomware attack in Pottawatomie County disabled services and compromised private data. The county eventually decided to pay the hackers $70,000 to retrieve this data and prevent it from being made public. In 2020, the websites of about a dozen different counties across the state were hacked and pictures of the Saudi Arabian city of Mecca replaced their websites. To make matters worse, two of these counties were also holding primary elections when this happened. Thankfully, this attack wasn't very disruptive and the election results were in no way compromised. The impacted counties simply were forced to notify the media of the election results rather than post the results directly on their websites. But as you can see, these attacks have been fairly common in the last few years, and these are only the attacks that I'm aware of. I'm sure there are a lot more happening. One of the most disruptive ransomware attacks in recent memory happened in Butler County in 2017. Hackers managed to gain access to the county's entire computer system and encrypted a significant amount of their data. This meant that their system for all county offices was down. The DMV, the county treasurer's office, the county jail, the sheriff's office, and even the 911 dispatch office. The dispatchers even had to start using walkie-talkies in order to relay calls to their first responders. So you can imagine how disruptive this attack was. And of course, it happened on a weekend. Now, the county did not pay the ransom, and they were able to get their systems back up and running, but it did take a lot of their offices a week or two to get back to normal operations. Now, if you find yourself in a situation similar to Butler County, do exactly what they did. Don't pay the ransom. You have no guarantee that if you pay the ransom, the hackers will give you access to all of your files. They may suddenly decide they want more money before they're willing to decrypt your files. So don't panic. Don't give out any personal information and contact your IT staff immediately. If you have backups, you should be able to use them to help restore your impacted files. Some other ways you can protect yourself from hackers is by using antivirus software and firewalls. Also, don't open suspicious emails from unknown accounts. It is also important to keep your system up to date. Often hackers are able to gain access simply because users haven't installed critical software and security updates. And then lastly, use unique passwords. If something is easy to guess, it's not a good password. So if one of your current passwords is listed here, please change it immediately. 
If you have problems remembering your passwords and you don't want to write them down somewhere, there are password saving programs and apps out there for you to use, and most of them are pretty handy. All right, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for taking the time to attend this presentation, and please contact me or one of my colleagues if you have any issues or questions regarding electronic records. Have a great day.